Blessings, 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 beloved. I am Mama Pam, a.k.a. Pamela Dobson of Smurf Family International Interactive Ministry. And Smurf stands for 7-Minute Read Family, 7-Minute Read Followers. I just have some 7-Minute Read Faithful Vote. I come on and they just keep on coming. They come to see what the Lord has to speak through the lips of Mama Pam. Well, tonight, today is Tuesday, um, April 25th, 2023, and we're reading from 2 Chronicles, the 19th chapter. 2 Chronicles, the 19th chapter, where Jehu's rebuke. Jehu is rebuking the goodness of God to Jehoshaphat. So, then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely. This was the mercy of God. Jehoshaphat clothed in the robes of the king and targeted for death by the army of Syria should have been killed in battle. Yet he cried out to the Lord and was preserved, returning safely to his house in Jerusalem. Now the fact that Jehoshaphat reached home safely is significant. It contrasts his fate with Ahab's and testifies to God's grace given to a person who was almost destroyed by undiscerning folly. God rebukes Jehoshaphat through Jehu the prophet. Jehu the son of Hanani, his father was a brave prophet, speaking to King Asa. The son Jehu also prophesied to Baasha, the king of Israel, in 1 King, the 16th chapter, the first verse, and the 16th chapter, and the 7th verse. Should you help the wicked? And love those who hate the Lord. Jehu exposed the sin of too much love in Jehoshaphat. He professed to love God, but he also demonstrated love to those who hate the Lord. He should never have entered his personal and military alliances with Ahab and the kingdom of Israel. Ahab did not love God. Ahab didn't serve God. Jehoshaphat have read and considered Psalms. 97 and 10. You who love the Lord hate evil. You who love the Lord hate evil. That's why our previous president of the United States of America is getting ready to try to run again. Evil. His father, you said the, uh, the Satan is the father of lies. So you find anyone that just lies, everything come out their mouth is a lie. Satan is their daddy. All right? Love and hate in this context are formal terms of actions within a covenant of treaty relationship rather than emotional feelings and help is a typical chronicles expression for formal support. Nevertheless, God think God, nevertheless, good things are found in you. God did not want Jehoshaphat to be crushed by the rebuke through the words of Jehu, so he included a word of encouragement. It's okay to fuss, fuss at folks and, and correct them and, 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 and spank them sometimes, but then it's also good to show a little kindness in your letting down the hammer. That you have removed the wooden images from the land. So God knew that Jehoshaphat did not approve of all evil, so he encouraged the sick king in the places where he did hate evil and refused compromise and have prepared your heart to see God. Not only did Jehoshaphat seek God, but he also prepared his heart to do so. This demonstrated the highly priority Jehoshaphat placed on seeking God. And this work of preparing or directing his heart is here ascribed to Jehoshaphat, as elsewhere it is attributed to God. Proverbs 16.1, Philippians 2.13, because it is man's action, but performed by God's grace, preventing, enabling, and inclining him to do it. Jehoshaphat's response. So Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem. This means that he restricted his adventures abroad. He no longer went to the northern kingdom of Israel and was content to stay where he should. 
my African sons and daughters. I encourage you to be content where God has planted you. If God has you born in Africa, you are a sure enough African Quit wanting to get out of Africa and come to America. You'll find it worse than you think it is in America. It's hard being a person of color, any kind of color. So you know if you're black from Africa, they're going to see you and automatically, oh, we threatened, we scared them. So be, God placed you in Africa. Be contented in one of the richest continents in the world. Africa's the best place to be. So if you're there, be Praise God. And brought them back to the Lord God of their fathers. The wording implies that Jehoshaphat did this personally. He went out again. So this was a wonderful personal work in the cause of godliness on behalf of the king of Judah. Those itinerant campaigns have no real equivalent in Old Testament and the prophets, even though they traveled about, were not involved in systemic, systematic teaching of the word of God. The nearest parallel is in the New Testament in Jesus' own itinerant ministry. Y'all have to excuse me. I can't halfway read because I'm so congested. I'm fighting over here just trying to breathe and then trying to get the words out so y'all can hear it. So y'all pray for me as I'm reading. Pray for the Lord to clear up the, clear up the sinuses, the ology, in the name of Jesus. All right, would y'all do that? Pray with me. Amen. So take heed to what you are doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in judgment. This was a high and appropriate charge to the judges of Judah. We can understand the interest the chronicler had in including these, this material, not recorded in First or Second Kings, using the example of Jehoshaphat as an encouragement to the leaders of the rebuilding community of Jerusalem and Judah after the exile. A very solemn and very necessary action. Judges should feel themselves in the place of God and judge as those who know they shall be judged for their judgments. Behave courageously and the Lord will be with, with the good. The prominent theme of courageous obedience is repeated again. It was the job of the judges to courageously do what was good and to then trust that the Lord would be good, would be, then trust that the Lord will be with the good. Praise God. So without good and wholesome laws, no nation can be prosperous. You got to have laws and rules and regulations to run anything, let's alone a country. And Bain are the best laws if they be not judiciously and conscientiously administered. Amen, amen to chapter 19 of Second Chronicles. Now we're going to roll right on over into, we are still on EnduringWord.com, EnduringWord.com. And we are reading Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, Chapter Twenty. Jehoshaphat's victory. Jehoshaphat prayer. Now it happened after this. This threat to Jehoshaphat and his kingdom happened after his return to seeking God, following his near death when he allied himself with King Ahab of Israel. The great multitude was a significant threat against Jehoshaphat, whose last experience on the field of battle was a na narrow escape from death. And Jehoshaphat feared. There was certainly a sense in which Jehoshaphat feared the great multitude coming against him. Yet the sense here is that he feared the Lord and was more awed at the power and majesty of God than at the destructive force of his enemies. Jehoshaphat feared, partly from human frailty and partly from the remembrance of his own guilt and the wrath of God denounced against him for it. Second Chronicles 19 and 2 
and set himself to seek the Lord. So Jehoshaphat set the example by his own personal devotion. He would not call upon the people of Judah to seek the Lord in a way that he did not. This is a recurring theme in Second Chronicles. The leaders who seek the Lord, we can expect God to do great things when his people, and especially the leaders of his people, seek him. Others who sought the Lord in Second Chronicles include the faithful remnant of Israel, Second Chronicles 11 and 16, the people of Judah under King Asa, Second Chronicles 14, 4, 15, 12 through 13. Jehoshaphat in the early part of his reign, Second Chronicles 19, 3. King Hezekiah, Second Chronicles 31, 21. King Josiah, Second Chronicles 34, 3. His attitude is summed up by the word seek, which occurs twice in Hebrew, though it is variously translated. This is a key word in Jehoshaphat's reign, where it has the basic sense of worship, but also means to discover, means to discover God's will. It shows that Jehoshaphat has a higher trust in God than in his military resources and proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. Here in the United States of America, they need to call it one day fast. Shut it down and go before God. Africa needs to call it one day fast. All that craziness going on over in Sudan. Call it one day fast for Africa. Shut it down, praying, crying out to God. That's what we need to do. Praise God. So this man of God, he proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. Jehoshaphat called the nation to express their humility and total dependence upon God through a public fast. That is abstaining from all food for a period of time, typically a day or more, and drinking only water. In Mark 9, 28, 29, Jesus explained that prayer and fasting together were a source of significant spiritual power. It isn't as if prayer and fasting make us more worthy to be blessed of, or do God's work. It is that prayer and fasting draws us closer to the heart of God, and they put us more in line with his power. Fasting is a powerful expression of our total dependency on him. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. This showed the Spirit of God at work among the, among his people, prompting them to response to the call it issued from their king, Jehoshaphat. To get this assistance it was necessary to seek it, and to get such extraordinary help, they should seek it in an extraordinary way. Whence he proclaimed a universal fast, and all the people came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord. So Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem. This large assembly representing the gathered kingdom needed a leader and the godly Jehoshaphat was the logical one to unite the assembly together in prayer. Adam Clark called this one of the most sensible, pious, correct, and as to its composition, one of the most elegant prayers ever offered under the Old Testament dispensation. The late renowned Gustavus, king of Sweden, would pray a shipboard, ashore, in the field, in the midst of the battle, as if prayer alone were the surest piece of his whole armor. And prayer is that sure armor for any of us. Pray, pray, and then pray. Are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? Jehoshaphat began his great prayer by recognizing the power of God over heaven and all kingdoms of the nations. Other peoples believed in localized deities, as if the Moabites had their God, the Philistines had their God, the Ammonites they had their God, and so on. Everybody had a God they done made. But Jehoshaphat recognized that the God of Israel was in fact the God 
of all kingdoms, of all nations, of all the earth, and indeed, God of heaven itself. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? So Jehoshaphat also prayed, recognizing God's great works in the past on behalf of his people. The logic is clear. If God had done great things for his people in the past, he can be prevailed upon to do great things for his people at that moment of great need. Just like he's here for us as we need him, we call on him, he hears and answers. We will stand in this temple and in your presence. Jehoshaphat stood on the ground of previous prayer and prior answers to prayer. This echoes the prayer Solomon prayed at the dedication of the temple. And it calls upon God to answer not only Jehoshaphat's prayer, but Solomon's also. Second Chronicles 6, 20 and 22. Here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. So Jehoshaphat prayed with both knowledge and understanding of God's word. He remembered that God did not allow Israel to invade these people when they came from Egypt to the promised land. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Come as you are. Come, Yes, baby, come on in this room as you are as we read the commentary on Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, since God did not allow Israel to destroy those peoples then, it would be unjust if he would allow them to destroy Judah now. He implicitly prayed that God would not allow his people to suffer as a consequence of their prior obedience. I like to plunge my hand into the promises, and then I find myself able to grasp with a grip of determination the mighty faithfulness of our God. An omnipotent plea with God is, do as thou hast said. For we have no power against these great, this great multitude that's coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are upon you, Lord. Praise God. Here, Josephat, a king standing before his people, openly confessed that he did not have the answer. Their only answer was to trust in God, that his power and goodness would protect Judah when nothing else could. The final phrase, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you, is one of the most touching expressions of trust in God to be found anywhere in the Bible. Praise the Lord. They said, our eyes are upon thee. What did they mean by that? They meant, Lord, if help does come, it must come from thee. We're looking to thee for it. It cannot come from anywhere else. So we look to thee. But, praise God, Pilate. I thank you. I appreciate it. But we believe it will come. Men will not look for that which they know will not come. We feel sure that it will come, but we do not know how. So we're looking. We do not know when, but we are looking. We don't know how. We don't know what thou wouldest have us to do. But as the servant looks to her mistress, so are we looking to thee, Lord God. Lord, we are looking to thee. Today, sons and daughters of the big old platform, the Smurf family, on this Praise God recording, we are looking to God for our help. For our help comes from the Lord. God answers Jehoshaphat's prayer. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, all of Judah, with their little ones, their wives, and their children, stood before the Lord. The sense is that after Jehoshaphat's great prayer, the people stood silent before the Lord, waiting upon him for some sense of direction or encouragement. You could have heard the sound even of the wind among the trees at the time, for they were just hushed and as quiet as you were just now. Oh, when you know the Lord means to deliver you, you bow your head and you just give him the quiet, deep, solemn worship of your spirit. 
Then the Spirit of the Lord. Now, do we read down too far? Because I know the Spirit of the Lord came in that summer. Let me see. I got the Bible right here. The Levites and the Spirit of the Lord. I think we're okay. Let me see. Okay, this is it. This is where we stop. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, in the midst of the assembly. Out of this huge group gathered together, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one man to speak to the entire assembly. This was a spontaneous word of prophecy that came as God's people waited before him and sought him. And what is the answer? What is the word that God is giving to the people? You're going to have to come back tomorrow as we read the word of God at 3 p.m. Then I come back at 7 p.m. and read the commentary on what we read at 3 p.m. What a mighty God we serve. To those of you who are coming in, I am Mama Pam, a.k.a. Pamela Dobson of the Smurf family. Smurf, S-M-R-F. Smurf, S-M-R-F. Smurf stands for Seven Minute Read Family. You can go to www.7minutereread.com. If you want to leave a donation, there's a safe donation button on that page. Um, be sure you be mindful of the way you spell the seven. S-E-V number seven. S-E-V number seven. You can Google it. You can search it. I'm all over out there in the internet world. So until the next read, God bless.